Hey, welcome back to JG3 Reviews, where we like to explore the world of fountain pens, ink, paper, and today it is an ink day. So I'm excited about this one. This is J.R. Bond's, and pardon my French, quite literally, I'm, I'm terrible at it, but Café des Îles, and that means island coffee, and I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I butchered that really quite, quite badly. I apologize. Anyway, this is an interesting brown ink. It has some pros and it has some cons, and I'm going to look at those today, but it's a, an ink that I've had for quite a while. Back, I don't know, I want to say it could have even been before the pandemic or right after stores started reopening. Somewhere in that window, we went to the bookstore in Austin, Texas, with lots of good paper and stationary fountain pens and ink and stuff like that. And we came across this ink. And my, uh, my wife and daughters thought, hey, dad loves coffee and dad loves ink. How could he not like this ink? So this was, uh, I want to say, maybe a Christmas gift from them. And I've really enjoyed it and I like it, but it has gone dormant in my collection for quite a while, and uh, we'll talk about why as we go through this review. So first, let's take a look at the color of the ink. We'll look at its characteristics, its water fastness, and all of that good stuff, and I'll share my experience with it and with the J.R. Bond bottles themselves as we go along. First, let's talk about the pens I'm going to use in today's test. The first pen is the Jinhao 992 with a number 5 steel fine nib. Good handy little pen. Cheap as a loaf of bread in most of the world. A loaf of bread's more than this pen here in Texas these days. But a really good little workhorse everyday pen. And second, I will show you how it wrote with the Majan N6, which is a glass dip pen. All right, let's start here with the Rhodia paper and that 992. And you can see that that combo provides nice shading, uh, no real color variation in this ink, but a little bit of shading and uh, no real feathering problems on this paper, which I wouldn't expect anyway. A little bit dry, and that is typical for this particular ink. In fact, the reason this was dormant in my collection for a while is because the first pen that I put it in was itself a dry writer, and I didn't realize just how dry this ink can be, and the combo was not good. So I had trouble with dry out and with hard starts and things like that. And yeah, you can just do a quick dip in a little bit of water, and, and it usually remedies that problem. But it just was kind of discouraging and, and kind of put me off of the ink for a little while. Then, here recently, I decided, you know what, I want to revisit this ink. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's good. Uh, and uh, I like the shading and the coloring of it. And it's different from most other browns that I have. And so I put it in this pen. And I think I tried it with something else as well. And the experience has been much better. Still, I, you know, you got to be careful after a few days. You'll have to dip that in water. But uh, if you're using the pen every day, it's really not an issue. And what you want to do is put this, because it's a dry ink, in a pen that tends to write wetter. And so next time I'll go with a pen that writes wetter even in this 992, and I, I think I'll be much more satisfied. Now second is that glass dip pen. And as you can see, it writes, of course, a little bit wetter. Uh, that's usually the case. Now this is more of a, I would say, a Western fine tipped glass dip pen. My other one that I use quite often is kind of a broad and, and quite wet, uh, but I chose this for this ink today. And there you can see this is Tomoe River paper, the old kind, and again you see some really nice shading. In fact, I think you can see that uh, better than on the Rhodia, as is often the case, and it looks quite good. It is a, a chestnut brown with that kind of a red tint hue to it, and so not overly dark. You do get some darker shading on the second, and there is actually a third pass here, but that's actually kind of hard to discern, but a nice ink and a, a nice shade, I think. Then I did also write here on one cheap notebook. This is a Brazilian-made Oxford just dirt cheap spiral, and it's not my favorite paper. A lot of inks behave badly on this paper, and actually that's why I chose it. It's kind of the, the, the cheapest quality paper that uh, I had handy here. And you'll notice that, again, you do actually still get 
that shading, which is nice, that doesn't always come through on cheaper paper, and still no issues with feathering. Uh, it appears even drier on this paper than it does on the Rhodia or the Tomoe River, but this does impress me. You don't see many problems of bleed through and ghosting here. Certainly, you could read what's on the other side. That's more a case of the paper than the ink. You do see a couple of dots here, and this paper is the only paper that I have that I've used on a daily basis where it has done that. And many other inks just bleed right through. So that actually, for me, is a sign that it is a pretty well-behaved ink. But I knew that already because I've written on like six, six different kinds of paper, and bleed through was not a problem on any of them except for this one. Just to give you one more example, this is a composition notebook made in Vietnam. That's generally a very good thing, as fountain pen users know. This is a true red, which I think is, what is that, Staples? And uh, again, you have nice shading. I didn't absorb that ink right away like the cheaper paper did, so not quite as dry. And I think it brought out the color of this ink quite well. And no issues on the back whatsoever. Uh, well behaved on Vietnamese composition notebook paper. So I like that about the ink. Uh, it is well behaved and the only issue is that, that dry out issue and you cannot leave it in a pen that you're not going to be using. Uh, you ink up a pen in this ink and then you decide you're not going to use it for a week or two. My recommendation would be to go ahead and clean that pen out because brown inks in general, at least this is my experience, if something's going to go crusty, it's going to be a brown ink. So ink it, use it, Keep that ink flowing and you'll be happy if you let it dry out. Well, then you're going to end up with some, some brown crusty pens and you don't need to do that, right? Now let's do the ink swab. Get out the old Q-tip there. We'll do the first pass. And dip that again, make sure it's good and wet for the second pass. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a third, let's do a third pass, why not? All right, as we watch that ink dry, you can see that between the first and the second, there's a good bit of shading difference. Between the second and the third, it really doesn't do much after that. Uh, it's a little bit darker, but not a great deal. This is where it just is extremely wet. You're not gonna usually see that dark a shade in normal writing. That's just because this is a lot more ink than usual. I will flip it over and as you can see again, well behaved. Uh, you put that much ink on the paper and it's not coming through the rhodia paper, you've got a well behaved ink. All right, let's do some dry times. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Thirty seconds. Just a little faint hint and 60 seconds and uh, still just just a slight hint so ironically even though it's a dry ink it isn't the fastest drying it's not the slowest drying but you know just be careful with it in terms of drying because it will look like it's probably dry but there might be just a little bit there that's still wet speaking of wet how about we do our water fastness test i think you have a little bit of hint there because i took a drink of the tea earlier and uh yeah a little bit of condensation gave us a bit of a preview trying to do it there again we're going to use distilled water here and we'll see if there's anything legible after a couple of minutes all right let's see how that did <laughs> wow Oh, we might have set a record here for disappearing ink. Um, yeah, this is this is not water fast. I mean, not even in the slightest little bit. Uh, do not sign anything important. I mean, you wouldn't be doing that with a brown ink like this anyway most of the time, right? So, uh, yeah, don't count on this to hold on to your important memories or anything like that. If there are things you need to write and you're hoping they disappear, well, you know, this in a rainstorm will have your back. So yeah, don't don't even think about it. As far as water fastness, you're, 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 you're not safe. All right, and looking at our chromatography today, really quite simple. Uh, it's a brown ink. <laughs> You see what I mean? It's just a brown ink. And you can see that there's a bit of a reddish, pinkish 
hue to this, and I think you saw that in the writing as well, uh, but not a lot going on in this particular brown ink. It's just very simply a nice shade of, of a brown ink, but the chromatography, uh, I won't say boring, but it's not the most exciting. Right. Let's talk pros and cons of the Island Coffee from J. Bond. So pros, it is a fairly affordable ink, uh, not too high, and uh, not the cheapest, but not too high. It is a well-behaved ink. I think it's the number one strength is that it's good on most papers, it does not do feathering, uh, doesn't do bleed through on anything but the absolute of cheapest of paper. Uh, so that was good. Very well behaved. I like that. And that's something that I definitely look for in an ink because then I know I can ink up a pen and take it through my day and it's going to work with pretty much whatever I do that I can use a brown fountain pen ink for. I don't have to worry about what am I going to be writing on today. I like that. Another pro is that this is kind of a less common brown, it seems to me. Uh, a lot of browns start to look a lot alike, even though there is, uh, when you put them side by side, some variants, where this one definitely strikes your eye as being different from, say, Diamine Chocolate or Monteverde Brown Sugar. Both inks I love a lot, uh, but this one is quite different from those, and so I like the variety of that. Cons? Uh, cons are, you know, it does behave dryly in a lot of pens, and it, that produces some problems of dry out and crustiness and things like that. So, you, you know, you do have to, while it's very well behaved on paper, in your pen, it's not bad for your pen as long as you're minding your business with it. Uh, but, you know, you can't just, it's not a set and forget it ink. You can't go back to this like a platinum with platinum blue black and let it sit for three months and then pick it up and write with it. That's not going to happen. Another con is not really the ink itself. It's just their, uh, their bottle. It's an interesting bottle. Aesthetically, it's actually one of my favorite ink bottles. It just has a nice looking shape to it. I like their design on their labels and things like that. And it has a nice wide opening. But there are two problems. One, it has this nice little pen rest here, but it's not at all useful. It looks cool when you're in the store and you think, oh, that'll be handy. It's also a pen rest. It, it doesn't work for very many pens. And so then, you know, you're kind of disappointed that it doesn't do what you thought it might do. And the other is it's shallow. It doesn't look shallow because you've got, you know, that tall cap and a neck and everything. And so it's, you know, regular height of the bottle. But the main body of the bottle is shallow. And so once the ink gets very low at all, not even down to half, you start having problems. It doesn't tilt and fill very well. And uh, yeah, so it's it's just not the handiest filling bottle. It looks great, but uh, it doesn't work out all that well. And I don't know, that, that kind of reminds me of some Citrons and Renaults that I've, I've seen around from France as well. It just seems to be one of those things. Anyway, there is that. They look great on the shelf. I like the way they look aesthetically, but practical day-to-day -day use, not the best bottle in town. But what do you think? And since we're talking about island coffee, what is your favorite source of coffee? Are you a Kona person? Are you Guatemala person? Peruvian? You know, where where does your favorite coffee tend to come from? I'm curious because I, I, I'm even more enthusiastic about my coffee than I am my fountain pens and ink, if you can imagine that. So where's your favorite from? With that, thank you so much. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe, and God bless you, and I hope you have a great week.